Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's a great morning this morning. Chuck and Colleen are here visiting. And uh, it's a beautiful day outside, cloudy, but still warm. This is one of the last Sundays, probably, that I can wear one of these shirts, right? We're getting into a new season. Time moves on. But it's great to have you, Facebookers. Great to have you guys. And uh, we'll be digging into some interesting stuff today, a little bit later on. But uh, glad you could join us. And we'll be cranking up in just a minute. Just a, one announcement, actually, and that is to remind you that you can sign up, and Facebookers too, you can put in your orders for official Lighthouse Church t-shirts. Oh yes, they're the genuine item. Don't accept substitutes. No, no, no. We have the original ones right here. So we'll be sporting those. We want to get the order off as soon as possible. So there's a sign-up sheet out there. And if your hand is too crampy and you can't write, you can talk to Sue right up there, right after the service. And she'd be happy to take your order. They're like 15 bucks. Is that what they are? 15 bucks for a t-shirt. Quality material, Lighthouse little logo on the front, Lighthouse Church on the back, so that you can advertise the good news of Jesus Christ wherever you go. So, uh, is what? Does it have a pocket? No. We might be able to, that's, that could be another question that Sue would ask. Uh, Betty, is it? Who's uh, carry your cigarettes. <laughs> we won't broadcast that. <laughs> so, well, let's start off with a prayer. Thank you, Jesus, for this most amazing day. Thank you for this island. Thank you for the beauty that you surround us with. Thank you, Lord, for the beautiful one that you are. We worship you this morning. We lift you up. And we thank you, Lord, that you are always lifting us up, carrying us in your love. We ask, Lord, that you might help us to gain insight, gain insight this morning and wisdom and understanding that our lives might be changed, molded, and transformed in the power of your truth, in the power of your grace, in the power of your love. We thank you, God, for all that you do for us. You're so great. We love you, and we invite you into our hearts this morning in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. 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 Let's sing some songs this morning. This could be a hand clapper. Those of you who can keep beat, keep a beat. <laughs> this plays into our theme this morning. God is our refuge and strength, the very present help in trouble.
Amen. All right. Woo! Yeah. I think you know this one. Spiritual growth is all about allowing God to mold us, shape us, and transform us. It's about giving our lives to Him and trusting that God has a better plan, that God has a better vision, that God has a better pathway for us to walk. And so, this song.
Lord, we give our lives in your hand this morning. Wherever we are in our trust level for you, we go to the max. We trust you to speak to our hearts, Lord, in various ways, different messages, but the same God and the same Spirit. Lead us closer to you. Align us. Align us with the movement of your Holy Spirit. Not only this day, but always, more and more, step by step. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Align us. Sue, you could go ahead and put that picture up. Do you remember where you were on the morning of September 11th, 2001? I do. I do too. I remember exactly what was going on. It's indelibly etched into my brain, into my memories. I can remember I was, I was, at, I was priest at uh, St. Dunstan's Episcopal Church in Davidson, Michigan. And the secretary came into my office that morning and she said, do you realize that a plane just flew into one of the World Trade Towers? And my first impression was some idiot in a little Cessna had accidentally gotten off course and flown in. And I said, oh, that's a shame. That's too bad. And she said, here. no, no, no. <laughs> that's not, she said, a full airliner, 727, flew into the building. And I said, oh, my goodness. And we were glued to the whatever internet we had in those days, glued to the news that was unfolding and was yet to unfold later on that day as plane after plane hit. Almost 3,000 lives were lost in a short span. And I can remember the emotions. My eyes welled up with tears. Not only at the loss of life, but at the loss of my picture of the United States of America being impervious to attacks. Not since the War of 1812 have we experienced something like that on our own soil. And there was something that broke inside of me that day. Not only the loss of life, but the loss of some other things too. And as the events began to unfold and as President Bush began that war on terrorism, so the course of the United States of America was recast on a new pathway. And some of that was good, and some of it wasn't so good. And since today marks the 21st anniversary of 9-11, I talked to the Lord about it, and I said, is there anything else, anything that we could glean that would help us, that would grant us some tools some spiritual tools for gaining some leverage with a world just about as crazy as it was 21 years ago. And Jesus said, yes, I think so. So that's what we're going to explore this morning. And I'm calling it prophetic musings because they're my, my musings, but I think there's, there's something of God's message in there for each and every one of us. But I'd like you guys to be thinking, and you guys on Facebook also, to be thinking about what have we learned? What spiritual lessons have we learned since that catastrophic event 21 years ago? What have we learned? What, what can help us to be able to navigate the present day situation as it is? So I'd like to take a look, first of all, at what it means to think about the prophetic ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives. To think about those words that come to us, those thoughts, those 
new ideas that invite us into a, a new landscape where Jesus is calling us. Those words that challenge us to go where no one has gone before, it feels like, <laughs> to venture out onto that path with Jesus. I'd like to take a look, if you turn in your Bibles, to Deuteronomy chapter 8. We're going to shoot into the Old Testament because the children of Israel were also launching into a new adventure. It seems like that's what the Bible is all about, new adventures and new awakenings. And they were looking at a new promised land. The Lord was reminding them of certain things. Deuteronomy chapter 8, the first five verses. Take a look with me and listen to the words. And God is speaking to the children of Israel through Moses, and he says, All the commandments that I am commanding you today, you shall be careful to do, that you may live and multiply, and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to give to your forefathers. And you shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led, has led you in the wilderness these 40 years, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. He humbled you and let you be hungry and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you understand that human beings do not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. Your clothing didn't wear out on you, nor did your foot swell all those 40 years. Thus you are able to know in your heart that the Lord your God was disciplining you just as a man disciplines his son. Isn't that interesting? How God connects disciplining with provision. That it isn't just the rod or the stick or a swat on the butt, you know, that we associate with discipline. That God disciplines us through his provision, through providing for us, to test us, to see how we might react. A little later on in the chapter, by the way, it goes on to describe the promised land and milk and honey and, and all those other wonderful things. But the Lord, there's a warning, and there's always a warning. He said, don't forget. Don't forget about that I'm the one who, that gave this to you. This is all a gift. That I'm the God who led you out of Egypt, out of slavery. And that's how God operates. He sets us free. But there's always a test when we, we follow the path that he has given to us. And the word that he's spoken, that we're to listen for that word, that careful commandment. And to step out in faith, one step at a time, following that word that's given to us. We don't just live by bread alone. But every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. And it's not like God just communicates with us every once in a, 10 years or 5 years or once in a while. I believe that God is communicating with us continually. Because Jesus himself is the word of God. And that Jesus is coming to us through the Holy Spirit at all times, in all places, in all circumstances. And that that word is a fresh word. It's like manna. It's like that bread that God put in the wilderness. It's like fresh baked bread, beautiful aroma. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And that's the word of God that comes to us. And sometimes we pick it up. Sometimes we don't. But that's the process of learning, that prophetic word that comes to us to direct us and oftentimes redirect us because we get on to our own path. We go, hey, Jesus, you're with me, right? You know, and Jesus, where'd you go? You know, and Jesus is off on another path and we scamper over, hopefully to join him on his path. But the prophetic word keeps us, keeps us in that abundance. Remember, God says to, that you may be abundant, multiply and be in the land that I have given you. That's the land that God wants us to be in. But it's a process of listening to the word being changed by the word and redirecting ourselves, realigning ourselves to where God is going. That's a continual process. 
continually being done. God is surprising us in every step. When we hear the word, it leads to wisdom. It leads to wisdom. It can be a fearful thing to begin with. But the fear of the Lord leads to wisdom. Proverbs 9.10. That you can begin with kind of that awe, shock of, oh my goodness. And it, and so many of the biblical characters, right? Old Testament and New. When God speaks to them, that's the initial reaction, right? Oh, and they're quaking. And oftentimes the response is what? Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't fear. Because fear blocks us from hearing the fresh word of the Lord in our lives, that prophetic word. And so as we begin to trust and, and to calm down and find that peaceful place, we're able to take in all that God wants to communicate to us in every situation. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and we go on from there. So I'm going to suggest three musings, just put them out before you, and hopefully, again, the purpose is to get your thought processes going and to be thinking about, well, what, what have we learned in the last 21 years? What are some of the things that, that I picked up or Jesus is trying to say to me that can rise out of something so horrific? I mean, that's typically how... God kind of speaks, right, out of the chaos or the horror of, of crazy things that happen in life. And he speaks powerfully and moves powerfully through that brokenness and through that pain and even through that darkness. I mean, take the cross. I mean, what a great example. Something that was so planned by the powers of darkness and, and God moves so power through, powerfully through the death of his son. So let's take a look at three things and then hopefully spark some things and then we'll, we'll have some responses. And, and you guys on Facebook too, I, I encourage your responses to write in the comments, you know, briefly, um, things that you've learned over the years and respond because other people will read those and that can be a, a seed thought or a catalyst for somebody else to go, yeah, hmm, God's kind of challenging me in that too. So music number one. For me, I realize our structures are vulnerable. When those planes hit the World Trade Towers. Paradigms of, of marketplace and or that plane skidded into the Pentagon. Oh my, into the Pentagon. And the other plane probably was headed towards the Capitol, they figure, or the White House or something like that but crashed in Pennsylvania in an open field through the courage of, of the passengers. Our structures are vulnerable. Our political structures can't protect us. No matter how strong our, our military or our political ideology, um, capitalism, all of this stuff, we're vulnerable. And that feeling, it hit me right really deep down inside maybe you felt it too it felt like we had been violated somebody had come in come in a thief had broken in through the back door to kill and destroy and they had broken through somehow some way our structures are vulnerable i thought about <laughs> Remember the, the picture, so many iconic pictures from 9-11. Some of them, I, I thought about showing them, but I thought, no, we don't need to go there. But I remember one of them was uh, the smoke. Remember the smoke was coming up? Remember whose face was in the smoke? Satan? You've never seen that picture. <laughs> it was quite a picture where he caught the smoke just at the right. This photographer uh, caught the smoke, and there's a face the outline of Satan in the smoke coming up from one of the towers. It was pretty dramatic. And I can remember other reactions too. My, my stomach clenched and the anger that I felt at terrorists. Osama bin Laden, but, but all Al-Qaeda, but all terrorist organizations. 
And we had had some, some brushings with terrorists who had, had done things with reporters and, you know, beheaded people and all sorts of things in a foreign land. And that was awful revolting on the internet, using the internet for their kind of showcase. And, but this, this hit right in, right in the gut of who we are as Americans. And I can feel that anger wanting to hit back and, and all of that. Our structures are vulnerable. But then God reminded me that in the midst of all of our military might or our, our strength as a, a political economic presence in the world, in spite of all of that, guess what? That God is our refuge and strength, Psalm 46, a very present help in trouble. And it goes, it talks about all the nations and, and everything that's going on in the world today and, and, or back then. And the psalmist says, yes, but be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. And it was an invitation to me, at least me personally, to make time again to find that rock to find that solid standing place where I can stand in the Lord and the things may happen all around. Nations may rise and fall. Things may crumble. Towers may go down. But the Lord is my refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble. And that my livelihood depends upon God and not the things of human beings. Psalm 118, 8 and 9 reminds us, it echoes, and there are so many places in the Bible that echo that same theme. Don't, God is your refuge. Don't trust in the things that are human, the structures that are human. Psalm 118, 8 and, 8 and 9. That God is our refuge. You do not trust in princes, in powers, in political things. We try to do what we can as citizens of this nation and citizens of this planet, but at the bottom line, we realize that we are citizens of a higher kingdom. As Paul says, our citizenship is in heaven, and from which comes a savior. And so I was reminded, and it's a humbling experience, but I didn't realize how much that I had kind of gotten a little lackadaisical that the world situation couldn't affect us. And of course, we've learned today, 21 years later, with the internet and everything going on and how things, are, our world has gotten smaller and smaller, that we are affected, that everything is our backyard now. It's not just way out there. But this started the process for me, a humbling kind of awakening. Our structures are vulnerable. God is our refuge and strength. The second musing has to do with that feeling of vengeance inside that I felt as things were churning in my stomach and just wanted to really give it to those terrorist organizations. Jesus reminded me and has reminded me of another thing. That enemy hate always fails in the long run. Enemy hate fails in the long run. Your speaker is out. Is my speaker out? Just died. Oh. Uh oh. That's okay. You can hear me. I'll project. So, enemy hate fails. And Jesus reminded me, of course, from the Beatitudes, you know, love your enemies and all of that stuff that we kind of gloss over. And, and Jesus reminded me that love is the force that will change this world. And that everything that God does, God's power, God's magnificence, God's beauty, every, all the, the aspects of who we know God to be comes down, boils down to some sort of uh, facet of that diamond that we call love. That the Apostle John identified as the very nature and substance of who God is, that love. 
And so Jesus began to work on me. And I'm not, I'm not sure that I'm a pacifist, okay, at this point. I'm kind of trying to get there. But this is that idea of aligning. But Jesus at least said, when you're, if you're going to love somebody, you've got to listen to their soul, their spirit, who they are. And I said, even Osama bin Laden? And he said, yes, even Osama bin Laden. I went, you're going to have to help me on this one, <laughs> Jesus. And, but at least making the effort, making the effort, again, to align, take our emotions, which are neither good or bad, you know, <laughs> wanting to punch some terrorist or, or monarch or dictator or crazy person in the face and just saying, instead of doing that, to open our hand and say, Jesus, teach me, teach me how to approach this person as you do. And so we think about Luke chapter 6, verses 27 through 36, where Jesus talks, that's a whole section where he talks about loving your enemies and you know, if he slaps you on one cheek, give the other, and all this, all this stuff that's really hard to understand, really hard to get a hold of. But it's possible if we take it in bite-sized bits. And I think it begins with Jesus. When we have that reaction, when we feel our stomachs tighten up, and this isn't just Osama bin Laden, but this is aunt so-and-so who just ticks us off at family reunions. <laughs> this could be your spouse, this could be your kids, this could be your pastor, whoever. Uh, but it's, it's saying, stopping, taking a time out, and saying, okay, Lord, taking a deep breath and saying, Lord, teach me, teach me a different path, teach me your path as to how to respond to this. And as those of us who start to do this, as we begin to open ourselves to what Jesus would call the kingdom of God, a whole new way of living, a whole new reality, as we begin to open this up, it's almost like little dots of light all over this planet begin to shine. Just like little lighthouses, if I can use our own kind of uh, mascot, a little lighthouses of light all over this planet begin to shine. Never underestimate the light that God wants to shine through you. Never, ever underestimate that. Enemy hate fails. Jesus would say to me, he would say, always listen and serve. Always listen and serve. And the question is, the presenting question is, Jesus, how can I listen better in this very difficult situation I just want to strike back. How can I listen through your ears to hear what's going on from your perspective? And how can I serve either this person or this situation? How can I be a servant? Give me the heart of the servant. Those are radical questions. But God will answer you. The word of God will come and will bloom in your heart. And it will not return to him empty. God will show you, not only show you the path, but give you the strength and the tools to walk that path. And you may stumble forward, but Jesus will be with you and he will teach you. That's what it means to be a disciple. Teach you along the way. And will help you to be able to find that more Jesus-oriented path than you were on before. That's what it's all about being transformed. Turn with me to Romans chapter 12, one of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible. Romans chapter 12. And I want to look at the last part of it. It's an amazing chapter. Paul sums up so many things in Romans chapter 12. But I want to start at verse 14 and read to the end. Just as a reminder of how Paul kind of summarized and, and, and brought forth the word of God, Jesus' word, spoken to his heart. He writes this, he says, Bless those who persecute you. 
Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty or proud in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all people. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with everyone. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will keep burning coals on his head. And then listen to this. Do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good. There is a goodness that exists. It springs right out of the character of God, that heart of love. There's a goodness that exists that is more powerful than any evil force in this world. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. We're to be on the aggressive. We're to be on the offensive. But it's a different kind of offensive. It's not powered by human adrenaline or our, our need to try to strike back. It's powered by someone so different than we are that we have to take a moment to pause and reorient and say, which way are you going? And to follow the one who is the source of life in all things. This is at the heart, this is at the heart of what it means to follow Jesus, is to be changed to be changed, which brings me to my third musing. Musing number three. And something that I learned from 9-11. That religion as only comfort falls short. Religion as only comfort falls short. Remember after 9-11, a lot of churches experienced an inrush of people who were suddenly religious. <laughs> We're seeking God. We felt vulnerable. We felt naked. We felt exposed. We're seeking God. Help us. <laughs> Comfort us. Help us feel better. And after a few weeks, the attendance went down. Religion that simply provides comfort falls short. Because Jesus' very first words, if you read the Gospel of Mark, the earliest Gospel, Jesus' first words, first things out of his mouth, repent, change your mind, do a whole different vision of life, is what that means. For the kingdom of God is arriving, coming on in, it's landed on your runway. The kingdom of God, a whole new way of living, a whole new way of seeing because God is there and everything orients to the presence of God. Everything is held together by the love of God. Everything moves with the love and presence of God. It's all about God. That's the, com the connecting particle, <laughs> but more than a particle, the connecting force that holds everything in life together, the source of abundance. But we have to change our thinking just like Paul says in Romans chapter 12, at the beginning, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed. And Paul went from one place of, of thinking that he was doing God's will and living in that pathway and all this, and Jesus said, why are you persecuting me? The very one you think you're serving. And Paul had his conversion, was knocked off his horse. And God invites us to be knocked off our high horse, too. That real spirituality, true religion, is about change, about personal change. And it doesn't just stop with us as individuals. It continues into the very institutions and structures that we affect. Oh, yes, you affect different structures, and, and whether they're family structures or political structures or whatever kinds of structure, you 
God, God has placed you in street, key strategic places. And the more that you can reflect that transformation, the more others hear that invitation. And those who have ears to hear, let them hear. And you may be surprised at who hears the invitation of God. Who takes it up? But you'll never know if you don't take your own personal step in that direction. Real spirituality is about change. It's about transformation. Jesus said in Matthew 18, unless you become like a little child, you'll never enter the kingdom of God. And it's about putting all of our great ideas about God and great ideas about life and so-called common sense and all of this stuff, kind of putting them off to the side. You don't have to forget about them, but at least don't emphasize them so much. And have a little openness to some fresh speech, to some fresh change. And being intentional about that, when you wake up in the morning saying, God, here's a new adventure. What are you going to teach me today? And Jesus says, well, come and see. And every day becomes a whole new adventure, whether it's a happy or sad day, whether it's a, an easy day or a tough day. It becomes a new adventure with Jesus Christ. And as you live out that adventure, people begin to see that maybe there's another pathway. Maybe there's a way that they could walk to, that they don't have to be stuck in, on this conveyor belt that they call life. Transformation. Those are my musings, anyway. And hopefully it's gotten you thinking a little bit about what 9-11 did for you. And if you're still stuck in a place of fear, God's inviting you to experience him as a place of peace and change. Or if you're in a place where you're holding on to some grudge or, or some sort of bitterness, whether it's against worldwide terrorism or against uh, political figures or, or people in your own family or whatever, that God invites you to go from a place of hate or anger into a place of peace. And God's peace never erases justice, but justice in God's eyes is something very, very different than what we put together. He's got a whole different recipe. And it starts with the cross. And if you feel like your spiritual life is kind of flatlined a little bit, if you feel like you've grown distanced from God, this is God's invitation to you to get back in. That he always has the open door. And we'll talk about this more next Sunday. And uh, just to give you a little teaser, Chris Christopherson will be helping me with the message <laughs> next Sunday. So I'm just saying, just a little teaser. But it's about letting God lead you in a new path. And deep down inside, even though we're resistant a lot of times to what God wants to do, and we got a lot of pushback. Deep down inside, deep in there, we know that the invitation is a true one. <clears throat> we know that it's a true one. And God is inviting each and every one of us to take a step in a new direction this morning. And you'll be speaking to your hearts in different ways. Listen to the word of God, the prophetic word that is coming to your heart this morning. Listen to that direction. Maybe it's a little tweak. Maybe it's a whole course direction change. But listen to his word. He will give you the strength, the wisdom, and the courage to follow through step by step. And if you stumble, don't worry. His hand is there to pick you up. He won't let you go. And so this morning I'd like to end with a song. We're going to play a song for you. It's called Learn to Love. And actually the words are, will be up there too. And let's sing that song as a prayer. To sing it as a prayer. It's a beautiful, quiet kind of song. Meditative kind of song. Listen to the words. 
And let the Lord and the Holy Spirit speak to you as we sing that together. How does that sound? <laughs> I love computers. Quick sip. Listen to the words.
And so our prayer goes forth. Thank you guys on Facebook. Thanks for joining us this morning. Just uh, thank you for your support, your prayers, and your financial support. And again, just reminding you on our webpage, www.lighthousechurchdrummondisland.com, that you can find a little giving tab. And also other places where you can email and just be able to communicate with us and, and find that refreshment, encouragement, strength to be able to carry on in the power of Jesus Christ, because that's what it's all about. So thank you for joining us this morning. Do join us next week when Chris and I talk about something very, very important. God bless you, and have a great week. <laughs>